Mihawk is lonely. He's been the strongest swordsman for so long that his life has gotten boring. Originally, he was this bored guy sailing around the Grand Line, aimlessly looking for a challenge, and probably depressed at the fact that he couldn't find a real skilled strong swordsman. He's become so far above all the other swordsmen that his life has become dull. He'd become despondent to the idea that anyone could actually beat him, that he's become willing to bet on just potential, just to have something to live for. Okay, maybe I'm making Mihawk seem sadder than he already seems. Really, the guy just wants to chill and fight. He's someone who's looking for a good balance between excitement and relaxation, which is something I guess we all strive for, so who could blame him? But while the title of the world's strongest swordsman has been Mihawk since the very beginning of the series, we haven't really seen even half of what he can do. The fact that he's never been pushed to a point of struggle suggests that we haven't even even scratch the surface of the full extent of Mihawk's ability. Narratively speaking, Mihawk's grand role is really just to wait for Zoro to eventually catch up to him to take his title of the strongest swordsman in the world. After all, he's just the sword dude standing in front of a sword boy asking him to beat him. In all seriousness though, something I don't think we question enough is how Mihawk got the title of the world's strongest swordsman. And I get it, the series is filled with lore and world building and so many other more important things that we've just come to accept that Mihawk, he really just exists to elevate Zoro. So we've never stopped to ask the question, how did Mihawk become the world's strongest swordsman? But I think now is that time. Was it a title previously held by a another more powerful swordsman that Mihawk had to defeat in order for him to be considered to sit at the top? Or was it a title that was simply eventually bestowed upon him because there was just no one else left to challenge him? Could this be attributed to the fact that there really aren't that many notable swordsmen in the One Piece world, despite the fact that the ultimate goal of one of the series' most central characters, Zoro, is built upon pursuing this title? But the short answer, or the most straightforward forward answer today is one that was implied in Mihawk's Viver card. His Viver card states that having spent his life honing his sword skills from an early age, Mihawk challenged more and more powerful opponents until there was no one left. And this suggests that Mihawk was just deemed the world's strongest simply because there were no more other swordsmen strong enough to fight him. But I'm not so ready to accept that simple answer, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But first, a friendly reminder to please subscribe to the channel. I wouldn't say I'm so ambitious to try and get the title of the world's strongest One Piece YouTuber, but I do certainly have my own goals. That's reaching 100k subscribers, and I'd really love your help getting there. Okay, so there is one seeming inconsistency or detail that has me questioning of whether Mihawk really did just get his title of world's strongest swordsman by defeating all the other swordsmen. And that inconsistency or that detail takes the form of Vista the former 5th Division Commander of the former Whitebeard Pirates. Vista is perhaps the most notable on-screen challenge we've witnessed against Mihawk, and according to their conversation during their brief clash at Marineford, it's as if this was the first time that these two were meeting each other. This is despite the fact that Vista was already a member of the Whitebeard Pirates as far back as 20 years ago as we've seen in Odin's flashback. And while it's almost universally agreed that Mihawk would have defeated Vista during their duel had they seen it through to the end. But this brief scuffle at least proved that Visto is competent enough in clashing against Mihawk and also good enough of a swordsman that words of his ability had reached even the strongest swordsman, whilst also confirming the fact that Mihawk does indeed keep tabs on other formidable swordsmen around the world, even the ones he hasn't met yet. Mihawk says to Visto that he would be a fool to have not have heard of the Whitebeard Commander. So yes, while I don't doubt that Mihawk would eventually come out on top as the victor had this match continued, but the point for the purposes of this discussion is that this shows that there is still one swordsman that existed in the world that Mihawk had not and still has not decisively beaten, thereby disproving the idea that Mihawk had received this title by simply defeating every other formidable swordsman in the series. So then let's try to figure out the truth 
of how he got his title, shall we? And to do this, let's first answer the question of not how Mihawk got this title, but when? And the best possible start to answering this question is with Mihawk's rivalry with Shanks. First of all, whether Zoro defeats Mihawk or not, I mean, I'm sure he will. Zoro will, you guys, don't panic. That's literally where Zoro's story completes. But regardless of Zoro, you could probably argue that Shanks will always be Mihawk's biggest rival. The two were rivals since the early days and are implied to have been equals, dueling countless of times, and these duels were even notable enough that even the world's strongest man himself Whitebeard took note of it, which is probably the biggest endorsement of a rivalry that you could ask for. But these duels occurred in their younger days, their rivalry ending the moment that Shanks came out of the East Blue minus one arm. Shanks and Mihawk's rivalry ended before they had reached their peaks. Now if we really want to gauge how strong they were when they were dueling, the only way we can answer this with what little proof we have is to go by bounties. Of course a bounty doesn't tell us everything about a character strength. For example, all three supernova captains, Luffy, Law, and Kid, ended up with the same 3 billion berry at the end of Wano despite their differing strength levels. Blackbeard went from a character with no bounty at the beginning of the series to someone who would quickly become one of the seven warlords. So yeah, bounties aren't a 100% reliable measure of strength, but at the least, it does give us an indication as to how Oda wants us to assess a character's strength. So taking that into a account. And going by Shanks' previous bounty, which was revealed in Film Red, Shanks' previous bounty was 1.04 billion berry. This was his bounty 12 years before the main story, which is also around the same time when Shanks lost his arm. And 1.04 billion berry is around the same amount of a Yonko commander's bounty. Meaning that if Mihawk had actually beat Shanks to get the title of World's Strongest Swordsman, then that would mean that the strongest person he would have had to defeat feat for that title would have been around the level of a Yonko commander. And surely, surely there would have been someone stronger that came along to challenge Mihawk for that title. Plus, I'm not really sure that Shanks is the best way to assess this question because it's common understanding that Shanks and Mihawk duels had no clear winner. Mihawk himself even said that he's not interested in settling things with a one-armed swordsman, indicating that their duel was never decided, meaning neither one of them decisively beat the other, so it's unlikely that Shanks was the person that Mihawk defeated to gain the title of World's Strongest Swordsman. But the question of who would be the strongest swordsman between Mihawk and Shanks had Shanks retained both of his arms is itself a pretty entertaining thought. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, it doesn't answer our current line of inquiry. We could, however, question whether there was a situation where Shanks and Mihawk had both each defeated all the other swordsmen in their respective sides of the seas, whether the strongest swordsman was a title that both Shanks and Mihawk previously held, perhaps a tug of war with the title changing each time they dueled. Did Mihawk just happen to be the winner of the latest match before Shanks lost his arm? Unfortunately meaning that their long-held rivalry was without a winner and therefore never settled, Mihawk almost gaining his title just by default. Personally though, I think this idea sounds like a recipe to ruin a character, especially because this would then mean that Mihawk decided that he would no longer fight Shanks at a period where he currently held the title of World's Strongest Swordsman. I think that contradicts the very reason why Mihawk stopped dueling with Shanks in the first place, so I'm gonna say that's unlikely to be the case. But can you imagine just how depressing this situation is from Mihawk's perspective? Throughout his countless duels with Shanks, neither one of them has left a significant scar on the other, yet Shanks loses an entire arm to a sea king? Yeah, a sea king that a pre-time skip Luffy eats for lunch. It's even more depressing when you consider that Shanks has gotten stronger and has ascended to emperor status since their rivalries ended. Shanks became an emperor six years before the current timeline. That happens to be six years after Mihawk lost interest in him because Shanks lost his arm. So Mihawk not only lost his best best rival, but also had to watch him ascend, perhaps often wondering how much fun he would be having right now if they got to go at it in what Mihawk would consider a fair fight. In any case, in light of Mihawk and Shanks' history, the first answer to that question of when 
Mihawk obtained the title of World's Strongest Swordsman is that it happened in the last 12 years. Or I guess more accurately, 12 to around 2 to 3 years ago, seeing as he had already held this title when we were introduced to him at the beginning of the series, but you know what I mean, in the last 12 years. So then we have to question, what did Mihawk do in the last 12 years to be considered the strongest? Especially now that we've established that the explanation suggested by his Viver card is not completely satisfactory. Perhaps the best explainable scenario where Mihawk could have been crowned the strongest without actually having to defeat all other swordsmen is by some sort of elimination process. Almost like a tournament, if you want to think of it that way. I don't mean an official gladiator style tournament, but sort of just informally. Think about if all the swordsmen cross swords all over the Grand Line, the winner of each duel goes on to face the winner of another match, and that keeps going until there is just one left standing at the top. For example, if Zoro beats King, but Mihawk beats Zoro, then you could say that Mihawk is stronger than King even if Mihawk has never fought King directly himself before. This could explain why Mihawk is considered stronger than those he haven't actually challenged, or those who haven't challenged him. Swordsmen like Vista, because Vista probably lost to another swordsman, and that other swordsman was probably defeated by Mihawk. But this scenario assumes that someone just keeps a tally of all all the sword fights that occur across the globe, which isn't entirely impossible, especially in the context of One Piece where we have a carpenter inhabitant able to replace a broken door within seconds, or a masculine panda that just keeps popping up all around the world. But I'd have to say that this process is potentially quite unfair. Just because you beat the person that beat another person doesn't mean that you're stronger than that original person that got beaten, especially because there are other factors that go into a battle, but then again, maybe the way in how Mihawk became known as the world's strongest swordsman wasn't entirely fair. But if we are discarding the idea that Mihawk beat Shanks to be considered the world's strongest swordsman, as well as discarding the idea that he beat every other swordsman in the world, I think a more straightforward explanation that we have to consider is that Mihawk simply defeated a swordsman who was previously known as the world's strongest swordsman. But then of course, now the question is who? Let's examine Mihawk's other title that we were introduced to. Apart from being the world's strongest swordsman, Mihawk was also introduced to us as one of the seven warlords of the sea. There was a lot of hype for the warlords upon their first mention, and having the world's strongest swordsman amongst their ranks demonstrated that this group consisted of strong individuals, so strong that at least one man, who is the very best in his chosen discipline, was part of this faction. In fact, for the longest this time, Mihawk served as the benchmark for the kind of pirates that awaited us in the new world. And because he was introduced to us as one of the seven warlords, excitements about seeing the other six heightened. So could Mihawk's title of World's Strongest Swordsman be somehow related to his acceptance of the warlord position? After all, the warlords have each had their own reasons for allying with the world government. For example, Kuma joined for Bonnie, Hancock joined to protect Amazon Lily, Jinbei served as a symbol of peace between human and fishmen, perhaps Mihawk joined the warlords because the former strongest swordsman was a former warlord. We know that Ace was offered a position of warlord after defeating a former warlord, so maybe it's common practice for pirates to replace the warlord they've defeated. Although if that was the case, I feel like it should have been disclosed to us by now who that former warlord was. Anyways, it seems that this is another case where where Mihawk's Viver card has again given us a sort of answer. Because here his Viver card implies that Mihawk's reason for joining the Shichibukai was so that he could freely roam the seas, suggested to be so that he could look for someone stronger to fight. In which case, it seems that even if Mihawk didn't join the Warlords because he defeated the last World's Strongest Swordsman who also happened to be a Warlord, it seems his joining the Warlords was still somehow related to becoming the World's Strongest Swordsman. And that fits Mihawk better as we know him, right? Mihawk doesn't really seem to care for piracy much, he's out at sea without a crew, maybe his only goal and the reason why he set out to sea has nothing to do with piracy but was simply to find the one called the World's Strongest Swordsman. Similar to how Zoro's journey started before Luffy convinced him to become a member of the Straw Hat Pirates. And if we frame it this way, it makes sense for Mihawk to have accepted the Warlord position. We have proof that Mihawk is able to recognize 
recognize the positives in an idea, regardless of how outlandish they may seem to him at first. He was the one that convinced Crocodile that it's a good idea to have Buggy as the figurehead of Cross Guild, even if that means that the world will consider them both as Buggy's subordinates. Similarly, Mihawk recognized the value of being able to sail the seas freely, even if that means being allied with the world government, because it would eventually help him achieve his goal. Although, I have to say that, on the other hand, it might have helped him come across stronger challenges even more, even faster, had he remained an outlaw rather than being a warlord. Because then this way, he would still have a bounty on his head, so people may still be interested in challenging him to try get his reward, and strong navy officers would also try to capture him and surely he would come across a strong swordsman in that plight. I think this again points out some of the inconsistencies between the Vivra cards and the other information that we received. The Vista inconsistency was one of them, but even this reason for joining the Warlord seems a little inconsistent. Especially because in SBS Volume 108, Oda suggested that the reason why Mihawk joined the Warlords was to secure peace for himself because he didn't want to be chased by the Navy. And I guess those two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Mihawk might have wanted to look for challenges in peace. I guess that makes sense, but still, again, a little contradictory. It's as if Mihawk wanted to look for strong challenges, but then on his own terms. He wanted to go after them, and he didn't want other people coming after him, apparently. Anyways, if we continue exploring Mihawk joining the Warlords further, we can combine this with yet another title that Mihawk has been revealed to have had once in the past, this title being Marine Hunter Mihawk. Going back to Mihawk's Viver card, we know that Mihawk suffered a great betrayal in the past that led him to become a Marine Hunter. Oda also suggests in that same SBS volume that that betrayal came in the form of the marines, which is why Mihawk held a grudge big enough to start hunting other marines. Seeing as this is a relatively unexplored and mysterious fact about Mihawk's past, you can't help but wonder whether this also has something to do with Mihawk becoming the world's strongest swordsman. For example, was the previous strongest swordsman a marine that Mihawk was aiming to defeat, and it was via defeating this strong marine soldier that the world government officially bestowed upon Mihawk the title of the world's strongest swordsman, and then also invited him to join the warlords very soon after. But given that One Piece is, at the end of the day, a pirate manga, I think it would be remiss if we don't discuss swordsmen who previously potentially held the title of world's strongest swordsman without delving into the idea that that person may have been a pirate. Maybe there was someone like Mihawk who roamed around the seas looking for a challenge. Maybe Maybe you're someone who was part of a pirate crew, maybe even an infamous pirate crew such as the Rocks Pirates or even the Roger Pirates. And if we start going down those routes, so far the only confirmed powerhouses also known to be swordsmen or at least wield swords and wield swords as a primary weapon are Roger, Rayleigh, and Shiki. And while I think we can safely eliminate Roger, we've already established that Mihawk gained his title in the last 12 years, during which time Roger was already dead. And before his death, there is no way that a teenage Mihawk, who has since dueled with Roger's former apprentice without decisively defeating him, would have had any chance against the late Pirate King himself. Rayleigh, on the other hand, presents a relatively high possibility if we're considering old legends. Rayleigh has been seen to use a sword and would have likely been one of the most notorious swordsmen back in the day, being the Roger Pirate's vice captain. Perhaps aside from being known as the Dark King, he's also held the title of World's Strongest Swordsman. Perhaps Mihawk and Rayleigh had a similar rivalry to Zoro and Mihawk, this time where Mihawk has been chasing Rayleigh training to become strong enough to defeat Rayleigh for his title. I've also seen a theory that Rayleigh may be Mihawk's father, and that theory seems to be based on, well, shirts? Come on, the patterns are similar, guys. So we could even incorporate that idea and say that Mihawk's goal was to pursue and surpass his deadbeat dad. Another candidate is Shiki the Golden Lion. Shiki, who did formerly wield swords, and since 20 years ago, when he hacked off his own 
own legs to escape Impel Down, Shiki has continued to sword fight, just simply using his sword legs instead. But I don't know if Mihawk would have battled Shiki who has no legs when he refuses to fight Shanks for having no arm, or for missing one arm. It's been stated that Shanks hasn't gotten any weaker since losing his arm, yet Mihawk still thinks it's not a worthy battle. So it's probably likely that Mihawk also would apply that same logic to Shiki. Plus, Shiki has received quite a bit of focus quite a number of times, and if he's previously held the title of World's Stronger Swordsman, I feel like that's something that should have been revealed to us by now. Same for the other figures who we know to be strong and also wield swords. For example, Fujitora. When Doflamingo is hyping up Fujitora as a strong fighter back at Dressrosa, the easiest way to have done so would have been to say, you're the guy that used to be the strongest swordsman, or even Rayleigh for that matter. I feel like that's information that we should have gotten by now. Perhaps the only swordsman where it's understandable that we wouldn't have gotten that sort of information yet is with Venus Juro and Figurland Garling, both of them being relatively new, especially in the case of Garling as a new character, and whereas for Venus Juro, it's only been recently confirmed that he in fact does actually fight using that sword. Either way, both of them are still very mysterious characters, and it makes sense that we don't know all that much about them, and that would be an understandable explanation if they were the ones, or either one of them was the one to hold that title. There is another explanation as to how Mihawk could have gotten this title, and this has to do with Big News Morgan. Can you imagine if Morgan just witnessed Mihawk in a really tough duel one time? He got really impressed and decided to spread Mihawk's triumph all around the world. Sort of like how Luffy was dubbed the fifth emperor despite not technically being one. Maybe there was no real criteria to award Mihawk with this title, but it's just a title that has stuck around. Which I'd have to say isn't the most satisfactory explanation, and I'm sure you would agree with me on that. Well, whatever the case may be, I'm sure that Mihawk's backstory will be expanded on during that final fight with Zoro, and I'm just hoping that by the series end, we'll get front row seats to witnessing Mihawk's story, his story of his rise to the top, one that's going to reveal a path of struggles, challenges, rivals, and an unwavering commitment to perfect his craft, a story that affirms for us why Mihawk was called the world's strongest swordsman. But as always, let me know what you think. If you have any ideas as to how Mihawk gained this title, I'd love to see them, so pop it as a comment below. If you enjoyed our discussion, like and share the video. Please subscribe to the channel. You can also support the channel by becoming a Patreon or channel member. Thank you to these lovely people for so supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.